Ladies and gentlemen, welcome here at Severo Institute School of Legal and Social Studies. Uh, my name is Josef Schimais. Many of you know I'm president of this school and uh, doing my best to keep the school alive also outside classrooms. Um, as some of you know, we had a wonderful summer uh, school over the past weekend. Um, and uh, we always try to approach social reality from multiple angles so that uh, we debate economics and politi politics or political science. We add some aspects that are close to legal analysis. Uh, we encourage students to study history. And I, I believe this is what makes several institutes special. You can study here these disciplines such as law, both private and public, such as economic policy, now newly, such as uh, political science. Uh, this uh, public talk is uh, a little piece in our attempt to promote our new BA program in economic policy. And uh, this talk this evening is a part of uh, a series of public talks called Severo Institute Academic Forum. As uh, some of you know, in the past we had here uh, famous legal theoreticians uh, such as Richard Epstein from um, Chicago University or Gerard Casey from University of Dublin. We had uh, philosophers and political philosophers such as David Schmitz from Arizona University or uh, Roderick Long from Auburn University. We had indeed economists uh, like David Friedman, Peter Betke, Peter Klein, or in May, George Selgin. Um, we also had political scientists uh, such as uh, a great skeptical environmentalist, Bjorn Lomborg, a couple of months ago. Um, all of those people tackle contemporary social issues uh, from uh, slightly different perspectives, but they have one thing in common, and that is that all those people appreciate freedom, and they provide freedom-based perspective on the issues. Um, today, We'll talk about money and banking and self-regulation of markets and indeed monetary mismanagement. Um, as you know, many, uh, money and banking um, is an area where we are dangerously close to central planning, though many people still cannot easily imagine that we can have a market-based production of money and truly free banking. The debates about possibility of having freedom in banking started to be part of modern debates after F.A. Hayek got his Nobel Prize in 1974 and then later published a book called Denationalization of Money. In this book, contrary to his earlier beliefs, he recognizes that history is a long sequence of inflations orchestrated by governments and for the benefits of governments. Um, he, Hayek, realized that money are too important to be controlled by governments. Our today's speaker was uh, the one who, as a leading mind in the newly formed free banking movement, helped us a few years ago to introduce Hayek's book uh, to the Czech market by writing an introduction to the ever first translation of Hayek's book. Uh, Professor Lawrence White uh, teaches economics at George Mason University. Uh, he specializes in the theory and history of banking and money and is best known, known indeed for his work on free banking. He received his BA from Harvard University and his master's and PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles. He previously taught at New York University, the University of Georgia, and the University of Missouri, St. Louis. 
Professor White is the author of many books such as The Clash of Economic Ideas, which is forthcoming, The Theory of Monetary Institutions, Free Banking in Britain, uh, Competition and Currency. He also edited F.A. Hayek's The Pure Theory of Capital, The History of Gold and Silver, three volumes, uh, three volumes of uh, free banking, uh, and many others, many other books. His articles on monetary theory and banking history have appeared in uh, American Economic Review, the Journal of Economic Literature, the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking, and other leading professional journals. He is a co-editor of Econ Journal Watch and hosts a bi-monthly podcast for Econ Journal Watch Audio. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Professor Larry White. I can get my notes to stay here, and yeah, maybe not. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming out on a rainy evening. Um, I participated in the summer seminar uh, that was just mentioned over the weekend, and one of the students there reminded me how long I've been working on these kinds of ideas. He said, oh, it's so nice to meet you. I cited your book, Free Banking in Britain, in my master's thesis, and you know, that was published when I was one years old. <laughs> I said, well, thank you for making me feel young. Um, so the question is, uh, can the monetary system regulate itself? Uh, and of course, the answer is going to depend on what kind of monetary system we talk about. But the common answer is, for any kind of monetary system, no, of course not. Uh, we need the state to manage the monetary system. In fact, just yesterday on Facebook, uh, a high school friend of mine, uh, whose political views are very different from mine, suggested to his readers that, of course we need government to manage money because after all, look at whose faces are on the currency. It's all political leaders. <laughs> uh, well, I hope to elevate the argument, make it a little more sophisticated than that. Uh, my view is that money can regulate itself under the right legal framework, and the legal framework is very simple, uh, private property and contract enforcement. That's really all you need. You don't even need a special constitutional uh, system of governance of money. All you need is ordinary contract law uh, and ordinary property rights, and then a monetary system will establish itself that will regulate itself. Um, let me talk about the different aspects of that argument. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the Austrian economist Karl Menger's theory of the origin of money. Uh, Menger raises the question, why is it that we have money? What makes people trade seemingly useless tokens for actually useful goods and services. Uh, and in his day and age, it wasn't such a mystery because the disks of metal that people exchanged actually had some gold and silver in them. But of course, today it's an even bigger mystery. Today, people trade slips of paper that have no other use than trading for goods and services, and other people accept them. And why do they accept them? Well, you can't just say, because they can buy goods and services with them. That just begs the question of why the next person accepts them. Uh, Menger said, we have to think of this as a kind of social convention, as there's not something about the physical properties of these disks or slips of paper that makes them valuable. It's the understanding that they will be accepted by others. And how did that arise? Well, if you go back to a barter system it's very difficult to make the exchanges you want to make in a barter system, that is, trading directly what you've produced for everything you want to consume. Some of the people who are selling what you want to consume don't want 
what you have to produce. Um, I gave a lecture the other day in which I used the example of someone who produces asparagus and very few people want to buy asparagus. And after my talk, somebody reminded me of a Gary Larson Far Side cartoon. If any of you seen that comic strip? It showed an ice cream truck that was driving around the streets selling ice cream, except it wasn't ice cream. On, instead of an ice cream cone on the top of the truck, there was a bunch of asparagus. <laughs> uh, not really a popular idea. Not too many people want asparagus. Uh, so it's better to trade for something that is more popular with other people. And when something becomes popular for trading, it'll attract other users because other people will know that they can trade with those who are already using it. So there's a kind of self-reinforcing popularity. And some commodity will be focused on and elevated to the role of being a commonly accepted medium of exchange. And that's what money is. So money emerges without any central plan, without any central design, without any social dictator, without people having to meet in one place and take a vote, um, just through people pursuing their own self-interest. It's a kind of invisible hand story. Now, historically, we know that, in particular, gold and silver became the dominant commodity monies around the world. Silver, from ancient times, gold began being used as a parallel money in the Middle Ages, and by the end of the 19th century, it was the predominant commodity money around the world. Why was it gold and silver? Well, it wasn't just an accident. It was because gold and silver had certain physical properties, and this was sort of commonly discussed by economists in the 19th century, that made them suitable for a hand-to-hand -hand medium of exchange. They were divisible. They were uh, durable. They had a high ratio of value to bulk, so it wasn't hard to carry around the amount you needed to buy your goods and ser services. Uh, there was one thing that held gold and silver back, which was in their raw state, they're not very uniform. Someone who's offered payment in a gold nugget or a silver nugget or gold dust is going to say, I don't know how pure this is, and plus I'm going to have to stop and weigh it so that was an obstacle. It wasn't until the development of coinage as a way of certifying the purity and the weight of the metal that was being offered that gold and silver really drove out all the other commodity monies. Um, so we can think of uh, gold and silver coins sort of becoming a dominant commodity money. Uh, now, if you believe in the the state theory of money, if you believe money won't regulate itself, your question would be, but who will produce the coins if not the state? And of course, from ancient times, governments have monopolized the production of coins. But they didn't have to, and they didn't invent coins. As far as we know, the first coins were uh, minted by, well, actually, minting is the wrong word. In the early days, they were hammered. Uh, the earliest coins were produced by merchants, uh, who then improve the metallurgy and improve the technology to produce better and better certification of the size, the, the weight, sorry, and the, the purity of the metal pieces that were being offered. Um, of course, governments discovered that it was to their advantage to monopolize the mint, uh, not because they could produce a higher quality product, they didn't have any technology that private mint masters didn't have. And not because they were more trustworthy. Actually, if you look at the history of Roman coinage, if you look at the history of medieval coinage, where there were many local monopolies, the local duke, sometimes the local bishop, uh, had the only mint in the area. It's a, it's a very sorry record of continual debasement. The quality of the coins went down and down and down as the mint masters tried to make a bigger profit by reducing the silver content and increasing the base metal content. That is, they put tin and copper and other things in the coins instead of silver. So it wasn't for quality control purposes that governments took over the mints. In fact, it was the opposite. They took them over so they could debase them debase the coins and thereby make a profit. And it was a big part 
of the revenue of medieval rulers, especially during times of war. Um, the track record of private mints is actually quite good. The surviving examples we have from the private mints in California show that the coins were minted more precisely than the government coins from the same era because the mints had a reputation to keep up. Right? The whole minting business is you bring me your gold and I will produce a coin for you that's easier to spend than your raw gold. Well, if my coin isn't trusted, then it won't be easy to spend. So I don't, can't afford to downgrade the coin because it'll ruin my reputation and my business will disappear. Um, okay. Now, if, if you imagine a, a monetary system, not that this was ever very, well, no, this, I guess this did prevail for a while uh, during the early Middle Ages. You can imagine a monetary system in which the only money is gold and silver coins. And then ask yourself, is that kind of system going to regulate itself in terms of the quantity of money and the purchasing power of money? Is the right quantity of coins going to establish itself? And uh, is the purchasing power of, of that money going to be relatively stable? And we were given an answer to this question a long time ago, uh, most famously by David Hume, who talked about what's known as the price specie flow mechanism. Specie is simply a word for coined precious metal. So it applies to either gold or silver. Uh, and the basic idea is pretty simple. If for some reason there's too much money in a region, uh, it's less scarce there than in the rest of the world, then its purchasing power will be less in that region. And if its purchasing power is less, then that is prices are higher in that region People in that region will look across the border and see, or look across the river, or across the English Channel, and see that uh, they can buy more somewhere else with their gold and silver, and they'll start buying somewhere else. And when they pay for those goods to be imported, the gold and silver will flow out, the excess gold and silver. So it'll flow out until the purchasing power is equalized. Right? So any discrepancy in the price levels will prompt an outflow if the local price level is too high. On the other hand, if there's not enough money locally, then prices will be lower than the rest of the world, and money will flow in until the local purchasing power equals the world purchasing power. So that's a self-regulating system that controls the quantity and keeps the purchasing power the same as the world purchasing power. Now, you may ask yourself, well, what about the world purchasing power? How do we know that that's going to be relatively stable? If you look at the economics of commodity money, right, it, it's a kind of money that can be produced. More of it can be produced by anybody who has the technical means to produce it. In the case of silver or gold, it means by anybody who owns a mine that produces silver or gold. So in that situation, and there's, no just, there's not just one mine, so nobody, no single individual or government or company controls all the mines in the world. Uh, if the purchasing power of gold, say, rises because for some reason it becomes, demand goes down, or there's a big flood of supply somehow, a low purchasing power of gold will discourage gold mining. And there'll be less new gold being produced, and that will tend to raise the value of gold because economic growth then will be greater than the growth of the money supply. So you'll have more goods chasing each unit of money. That'll bring the purchasing power back up. On the other hand, if the purchasing power is higher than usual, that'll encourage mining. That'll bring more gold and silver onto the market and it'll bring the purchasing power back down basically to the level that's determined uh, by the cost of gold mining. So that, the purchasing power of gold in the world as a whole is self-regulating and there's a kind of, the statistical term for it is mean reverting property to the purchasing power of gold. If you look at historical plots of the purchasing power of gold, or it's usually reported as the inverse, the price level in terms of gold, you'll see that although there are periods in which it sort of drifts away from the trend, maybe for a decade, it comes back again. 
because if it goes below, purchasing power goes down, that discourages mining, that brings it back up. If it goes above, that encourages mining, that brings it back down. So the purchasing power of gold has been remarkably stable over decades um, when it's been used. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay. Um, let me go back to the fact, well, I want to bring in uh, bank-issued money now and ask whether that will regulate itself. And up to this point, um, everybody in the Austrian School of Economics is on the same page, but when we begin to talk about bank-issued money, uh, we find that some people who call themselves Austrian economists aren't too keen on the idea that bank-issued money will regulate itself. They're worried about it. So let me try to... Uh, put those worries uh, to rest. Uh, first, uh, let me say the one reason that uh, banking became important in the Middle Ages was because governments had monopolized the mints in each locality and then proceeded to debase the, the coinage. So the silver content went down over time. Interestingly, it was silver coins that governments had local monopolies in and so they debased them. Nobody had a a monopoly of gold coins because gold coins weren't for small transactions, they were for large international transactions. And people doing international trade weren't confined to the coins of any one country. They could use Spanish coins, Italian coins, British coins, German coins, gold coins for large volume transactions. And so the same mints that debased their silver coins where they had a local monopoly didn't debase their gold coins. They were very careful to keep the value of the gold coins up. Uh, but back to the silver coins, because they were debased, it was very difficult for merchants to go from one, say, Italian city-state to another. A merchant who went from Genoa to Milan would discover that people wouldn't take his coins from Genoa because they didn't know what they were worth. Who knew? It changed from year to year. So he would have to go to a money changer, get the local coins from Milan, before he could make transactions. And the coin changers began to offer a new service. We're not sure exactly when. The first sort of documentation we have of it is from around the year 12,000, sorry, 1200, <laughs> 1200 AD. Uh, and the service was, you can leave your silver on account. And then when you want to, you can come back and take coins out. So merchants who went from city to city would have an account in the cities they traveled between, and then when they arrived, they would already have some money waiting for them. Um, and then the following sort of event took place. Two merchants who wanted to make a transaction, in the old days, they would pay in bags of silver coins, let's say. Now they both had accounts at the same bank, at the same depository. And they would say, you know, instead of me going to get the coins, taking them out, carrying them across town, giving them to you, then you can count them or maybe weigh them, and then you carry them back across town and put them back in the vault. Why don't we just meet at the depository, and then we can just take the coins out, you can see them, and we can put them back in. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> we can meet at the depository, and we don't even have to take the coins out. You trust the banker, you have an account balance at the banker. I trust the banker, I have an account there. At the end of the day, if we take the coins out and put them back in, all that happens is my account balance goes down, your account balance goes up. We can do that without looking at the coins. Just tell the banker. Remove 100 coins from my account balance and add 100 coins to your account balance. Voila. Actually, I shouldn't say that the accounts were denominated in coins. One of the services the bankers provided was not to denominate in coins, because who knew what a coin was worth from year to year? Instead, the bankers denominated accounts in pure units of silver, ounces or grams. Um, and so you had a very strange uh, phenomenon that the unit that bank accounts were kept in was not a unit that was on the faces of the coins. It was a disembodied unit. Historians actually call it ghost money. Very spooky. But it wasn't completely disembodied. It was another name. It was a fixed amount of silver. 
But that way, bank account balances were more uniform. You knew what you were getting, more uniform than coin, because with a coin, you didn't know what you were getting. The symbol of the medieval bankers, in fact, what they hung outside of their shops was a balance scale, because bankers spent a lot of time weighing coins. So they would, there's a famous uh, picture, a famous Dutch painting of a banker, and in his hand, in his left hand, he's got a balance scale, and he's putting coins on one side of the scale and weights on the other side. So he's weighing the coins that somebody has brought him for deposit, and in his right hand, he has a quill pen, and he's writing down the amounts. And that's a lot of what bankers did. But they kept the accounts in pure silver units. Um, so once people learned to meet at the banker's office and say, let's just make the transfer on the books of the bank, the payment is not being made in coins anymore. The payment is being made in claims to coins. It's being made in claims on the balance sheet of the bank. It's being made by transferable bank balances. Right? So now we have a new phenomenon, which is people are paying each other with claims on bankers, not with physical coins. Uh, if you want to give a technical name to that, economists call the, the money that is money in and of itself, sort of directly physical coins, outside money. It's, it's money outside the banking system. But the money that's being paid by deposit transfer, that's inside money. Right? So it's, a, it's still money. It's a commonly accepted medium of exchange, at least among people who have bank accounts. But it's not the coins themselves. Right? So bankers got into this business because it was great convenience for their customers to pay each other that way. It was more uniform than coins and it was less bulky than coins, all right? Much easier to pay someone by telling the banker to pay them than to have to carry around bags of coins. Less dangerous, too. In the medieval trade fairs, the bankers would go and set up booths, and then their customers would come and say, I'm paying 100 silver ounces to this guy, so it would be recorded in the books. Um, now, I said that these are claims on the banker. I need to say more about what kind of claims they are. They're debt claims. They're IOUs. Very early in medieval banking, some people didn't want that. They just wanted storage for their coins. And people who wanted storage for their coins would bring their coins to the banker in a bag, and the bag would be sealed with a wax seal. And it was given to the banker with the understanding, explicitly, that the banker's not to go in the bag. This is not money for him to use. This is just for him to store. And for that, an explicit storage fee was paid. Other people brought money to bankers loose, loose coins. The banker would weigh them and say, okay, this is the amount of your deposit. Those people were lending money to the banker because the banker, and the clear signal of that was, the banker would pay them interest. There's no way for a banker to pay interest on an amount that he's simply warehousing. He's not earning anything on it. So a banker who says, I don't charge storage fees, in fact, I pay you interest, and by the way, you have to bring me loose coins, not coins in a bag, <laughs> is clearly issuing a debt claim against himself, an IOU. It's not a warehouse claim. It's not a promise that the coins are always gonna be there in the vault. It's a promise that you will get equivalent coins back when you come and ask for them. Right? And so. It depends on the fact that coins have this property that they're interchangeable. Or what you care about, well, what you care about is the amount of silver you get back, not that you get any specific set of coins. Uh, so that's impar important to the story. Um, okay. So, some e economists, as I've mentioned, have had a hard time understanding why anybody would accept such an arrangement with the bank. They claim, uh, Murray Rothbard being one of them, that if people left their money with a banker, they must have thought that it was all remaining in the vault. And it was only because they were hoodwinked that they agreed to leave their money with a banker who in fact was going to lend it out, who was going to practice fractional reserve banking, meaning the amount in the vault was only a fraction of the claims that the depositors had. 
But I'm saying no, it doesn't have to be hoodwinking. It can be that it's a better deal if your purpose is not just storage, if your purpose is to make payments because it's a more economical payment system to have the claims being fractionally backed, then you don't have to pay storage fees and you can earn interest on your account. Now there is a risk. There's a risk that when you come to get your coins back, the banker doesn't have them. If too many people come at the same time, he's not going to have them. So there is a risk, but as long as that risk is small enough, people will accept the deal. And the risk was small in well-run, reputable banks that went on for decades, sometimes centuries, without ever defaulting on redemption for anybody who actually came in and wanted to get gold and silver. Uh, so it's a, it's a feasible arrangement, and people agreed to it as long as they trusted the banker to actually make good when they needed coin. It's obvious what the advantage to the banker is of lending out the money. And so if you don't think there's any advantage to the customer, you must think the customer is being hoodwinked. But I'm saying there is an advantage to the customer, no storage fees and interest on the account balance. And people understood that and voluntarily agreed to it. Um, so there's no need for fraud if you want to get people to attract, uh, bring you money on deposit, even on deposits that are redeemable on demand. Uh, there's another kind of bank-issued money that became important and actually became bigger than bank deposits, and that's bank-issued currency or banknotes. If you look at the face of a banknote, it typically says something like, will pay the bearer on demand 10 crowns, or promise to pay to the bearer on demand 10 crowns. So that's the language of a debt contract. I have an obligation to pay you. Uh, and then there's more language, at our office, uh, on demand. So the bearer is anybody who brings the note in. So it can serve as currency. It can circulate around. Um, if you didn't have fractional reserves, if a banker didn't have fractional reserves, he could never issue this kind of currency that circulates from hand to hand anonymously at face value. Because if he had 100% reserves against it, somebody has to pay the storage fees. Who's going to pay the storage fees? The banker doesn't even know who's got the note. He lent it to one person or handed it to one person in exchange for coins, and that person spent it, and it's somewhere else now. There's no feasible way to collect storage fees, uh, nor would it be so attractive if you had to pay storage fees on the uh, currency in your wallet. Uh, so people who think that Banknotes only gain circulation by imitating warehouse receipts uh, has evidently never looked at the language on the banknote and never compared it to the language on a warehouse receipt because the language on a warehouse receipt is very different. It says, if you deposited grain in my warehouse, you only get it back after you pay the storage fees. It's very clear about that. So there's no danger that the two things have been confused. And so there's no compulsion here in fractional reserve banking. Nobody has to deal with a fractional reserve bank if they don't want to. And to, even today, you don't have to. If you don't want a bank deposit, you can rent a safety deposit box and just keep your coins there. Um, but if you'd rather have low fees and interest, uh, you have a bank account. Okay. Uh, there are some other arguments that have been made in the 100% reserve versus fractional reserve debate, but I'll leave those for question and answer in case anybody wants to raise them. A sort of typical uh, concern by mainstream economists is, isn't it going to be chaotic with every bank issuing its own currency? Aren't you going to have floating exchange rates within the country between banknotes? And, and the answer is, well, that would be inconvenient if it happened, but because it would be inconvenient, Bankers want to make sure that it doesn't happen. If I'm a banker and I want my banknotes to circulate widely, then I want them to circulate at face value, at 100 cents on the dollar. I don't know what the fractional unit of the crown is called. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe you don't have any anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. So what will I do as a banker? Well, I will set up a branch banking network so that I have redemption stations at many places. And if there are other towns where I don't have enough business to open an office, I can make an agreement with the banker in that town. If you accept my banknotes at par, I will accept your notes at par at my offices in towns where you don't have an office. And bankers made these kinds of agreements in order to do more business. Both bankers would gain from this kind of agreement. And then what would banks do with all the notes they were collecting and similarly all the checks they were accepting? They would meet at the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse is where banks would meet, present their claims against each other, and settle up the difference, typically in gold or silver, uh, in a gold or silver standard. So all the bank notes, all the checks were ex accepted at face value or at par throughout the system. There wasn't that kind of chaos that would happen if you had floating exchange rates between banks. These kind of results you see historically. So this is not just a fairy tale I'm telling. Uh, you see it where it wasn't prohibited. The natural system is for there to be a commodity standard, but for most retail transactions to be made with banknotes or checking deposits, um, and for those banknotes and checking deposits to be accepted at par, at face value, wherever you go. And you see that in Scotland, uh, which is an example of free banking that I've studied the most. You also see it in Canada uh, before it was outlawed. You see it in Sweden. You see it in Switzerland, Australia. Uh, one of my students made up a list, a table, of all the places where there had been this kind of competitive note issue system, and there are more than 60 examples uh, historically. There are still a few places in the world today where you can see private bank notes. They still have them in Scotland, they still have them in Northern Ireland, and they still have them in Hong Kong, because for whatever reason, the banks that had the right to issue notes never lost the right. Um, they don't have exactly gold or silver standards there anymore. It's redeemable for something else. All right. At least down to my last two points here. But that's not the system we have today, right? We have fiat money. We have irredeemable money. Uh, or as one economist I heard say, we used to have money that was an IOU, IOU gold. Now we have money that's an IOU nothing. If you want to go and redeem your 10 crown note, what can you get? Two fives, that's it. No silver, no gold. Will that kind of money regulate itself? No, that kind of money will not regulate itself. That kind of money needs to have just one issuer. If everybody had the right to counterfeit identical crowns, you'd have a flood of money. Whereas not everybody can produce gold and silver coins at zero cost. You have gotta mine the gold and silver. Uh, Hayek, in his denationalization of money, imagines a system where lots of competing issuers each issue their own irredeemable currency, but with protected trademarks so that they can't counterfeit each other's brands. He thinks that kind of system is going to be popular with the public. I find that doubtful. I think most people would rather have a money they can redeem than a money that they can't redeem but just have to rely on the promise of the company that it will maintain its value. So we have this problem today. We have central banks that don't regulate themselves. We have to put limits on them. We haven't done a very good job so far. There was sort of the last great effort at writing a central bank constitution was the European Central Bank Constitution. And they wrote in the Constitution, we have one goal, and that is price level stability. And they quickly passed a bylaw which said, when we say that, we mean less than 2% inflation. And for a while, they stayed within that range of 0 to 2% inflation. Currently, they've been above 2% for several years with no sign of going back. Why? Because they no longer obey the Constitution. They've become concerned with the sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone, and the European Central Bank is buying Greek debt and Italian debt and Spanish debt, or 
it's lending money to banks so that they can buy that debt to try to prop its value up. So they've let the concern about the value of money slide. So it's kind of a shame. I, I was hoping it would work. I'm not real surprised it hasn't worked, though. Uh, so what are our alternatives now if we want to reestablish self-regulating money? Well, we could go back to a gold standard. There's enough gold. It hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, if we don't, if that's politically impossible, there has to be some other mechanism arrived at for constraining central banks. And that's the sort of the world of the second best in which I don't have any very strong preferences about how to do it, but something has to be done to constrain central banks because they're not going to constrain themselves. So I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. Basically, saving accounts because uh, I have uh, several accounts in different banks here in Czech Republic, in the United States, in Russia, and in Canada, and none of them pays any in, in interest. Uh, it's just the opposite. I'm paying fee. So basically, I'm expecting all my money to be there any moment, mm -hmm. which I know is not the case in the current banking system. But what I would expect is that all my money. Uh, are there to take uh, to withdraw them, notwithstanding how many people are withdrawing them at the same time, and that's the specific of deposit account, contrary to the saving accounts that pays interest. Uh, as to the deposit box, I think I believe I'm paying extra uh, for uh, not just for extra security, but for the fact that nobody knows how much money and what exactly do I have in this sealed bag. Uh, that was the objection, and the question is, uh, what do you think about Bitcoin, Seth, uh, as a private banking system? Okay, um, so you're right. It's not necessarily the case that banks can afford to pay interest. They can afford to pay interest only if they're earning interest. And in today's environment, central banks have driven interest rates so low that on short-term IOUs, the interest rate is practically zero. And so the uh, administrative costs of running the bank account exceed what interest there is to be paid. I mean, there, there are some accounts you can get where it's strictly online, and so the administration costs are very low, where you can get trivial amounts of interest. But in a normal situation with positive interest rates uh, in the economy, you get interest. But you're right, not today exactly. Unless you put your money in Australia, which I would recommend. <laughs> uh, now, Bitcoin is an interesting question. I'm not sure I completely understand it. Uh, for one thing, it doesn't follow the pattern uh, of Carl Menger's theory of the origin of money because it never had any commodity use, at least not in the usual sense. It sort of raised itself by its own bootstraps into having a positive value. Um, it isn't yet a very commonly accepted medium of exchange. Um, actually, we don't know what the volume of transactions in Bitcoin is. We know the volume of uh, account balances, but that, of course, goes up and down with the exchange rate. But mostly people seem to be buying Bitcoin uh, as a speculation, hoping the value will keep going up. I understand there are a few places like the illegal marketplace called Silk Road where people actually do buy things, illegal things in uh, Bitcoin. And there are ways in which Bitcoin is easier to transfer internationally than some other kinds of money. Uh, so maybe there is some commodity-like use for it in that sense and maybe there are some transactions from which it could grow into a more generally accepted medium of exchange. Uh, but right now Besides the obstacle that the tax authorities don't like it and they would like to stamp it out, and the U.S. government has already hassled 
one of the exchanges, Mount Gox, uh, it is in kind of a chicken and egg problem or a critical mass problem. It's not commonly accepted as a medium of exchange. You can't go to the grocery store and buy milk with Bitcoin. And so most people don't want to be paid in Bitcoin. They might have a little Bitcoin on the side. So it's going to have to move beyond being that kind of niche for it to become a viable uh, currency for everyday use. It has some potential in that it's easy to transfer. And in fact, you don't need the intervention of a bank, although people do find it more convenient to use exchanges. It has a disadvantage, which is the way the validity of your Bitcoin transfer is certified or validated is that the, uh, the history of all the transactions that generated your balance sort of have to be reviewed by the system, which is it's a widely distributed system. And that takes a few minutes. And most people don't want to wait a few minutes when they're buying groceries. They want to swipe their card and go. There are other cryptocurrencies that are now competing with Bitcoin, saying, well, we have a clearing system which will instantly confirm that your transaction is good. It doesn't take 10 minutes. So maybe one of those will succeed better than Bitcoin. I don't know. We'll have to see what the market tells us. Uh, my name is Vitor Lichka. I'm a student also here. Um, I would like to ask you, what's your current take on, on the situation since Summers decided he's not going to run for chairman of the Fed? <laughs> and I had heard uh, an incredible remark on Bloomberg today by, by the guy who runs the show that maybe maybe now it's when nobody wants to take the job maybe now it's time for Ron Paul to take the job so I'm just wondering what's your current current take on, on, on the situation right now well now that Larry Summers is no longer in the running I suppose I should be careful about what I say because I don't want to disqualify myself uh, no I, I think I have disqualified myself many times over um, When it was uh, Larry Summers versus Janet Yellen, my question to my friends on Facebook was, well, who do you prefer, the corrupt Keynesian or the ideological Keynesian? Right? That was the choice. Um, I wonder, somebody told me that the, the person who is sort of directing the search uh, for Obama is Timothy Geithner, the former Treasury Secretary. So I wouldn't be surprised if the nominee turns out to be Timothy Geithner. Uh, but among, you know, different Keynesians of different stripes, which is all that we're going to be offered, I don't have any strong preference. I mean, Janet Yellen is a fine economist in terms of having a long publication record, uh, but she's, uh, I wouldn't be as confident with her in charge of the central bank as uh, with somebody who had a more hard money understanding of things. Um, but of course, you know, trying to run the monetary system is a job that nobody can really do. It's trying to centralize decisions that ought to be decentralized. There ought to be dozens of banks making different decisions about how much of their money they want to issue instead of one bank determining the amount of money in the entire system because they're almost bound to get it wrong. I have a question. Uh, maybe uh, the fractional reserve banking system uh, are in a current uh, condition uh, overdeveloped uh, because uh, they are all, all kinds of government guarantees so, mm -hmm. and everybody uh, has the incentive to open uh, the, uh, uh, the current balance account uh, in the comparison uh, Maybe in free society there, there will be less fractional uh, reserve uh, banking and more people would want to hold their deposit uh, 100% backed. So what do you think about it? Yeah, it's, it's true that today uh, fractional reserve banking is subsidized in the sense that we have deposit insurance, deposit guarantees, which are typically underpriced. 
Uh, and so depositors don't worry about the investment safety of their banks. They just look for the sticker in the window that says the government guarantees it. Uh, but there was fractional reserve banking for centuries before government guarantees came along. Right? So as I said, uh, we know from at least 1200 AD people were doing fractional reserve banking. And government guarantees, at least at the federal level, at the national level, didn't arrive until the 1930s. Right? So for a long time, people chose among banks based on their reputation for safety. They weren't indifferent to the activities of the bank, and that provided a lot more incentive for bankers to behave safely. Now, there's another alternative which was only invented in the 1970s to fractional reserve banking and would probably be more attractive if there weren't deposit insurance, and that's the money market mutual fund. Right? So in a money market mutual fund, you don't have a claim to a fixed number of dollars or crowns or euros. You have shares whose value is marked to market every day, but money market funds only invest in very safe, very short-term, very liquid assets, and so the value doesn't fluctuate much. So it can be used as a check-writing account, and money market mutual funds do allow check-writing privileges, but they're not subject to runs the way banks are. If there's a bad event to a bank's portfolio, there might not be enough assets left to pay everybody. If people suspect that, then they run the bank because only the people at the front of the line get paid. There's not enough to pay the people at the back of the line. In a mutual fund, if there's a bad investment uh, event, the value of everybody's claim on the fund already went down. It's too late to get back 100 cents that you had yesterday. You've already gotten down to 95 cents, let's say. There's no sense in getting there earlier. Everybody can get 95 cents. The claims can't add up to more than the assets. And so it's not subject to runs. So that might be an, a more attractive alternative in a world without deposit insurance. But traditionally, what banks did was they invested conservatively and they kept adequate capital. Before deposit insurance, banks kept 20% capital. Now they keep as little as the deposit insurance agency will let them keep. If I may, do, do we have any data on how people understand fractional reserve banking? Do we know whether people really know that the money is not sitting there, both now and historically? If you look at historical debates about banking, read newspaper columns from the 19th century or even the 18th century, people understood that banks were lending out their money. They understood that you had to choose wisely when you chose which money to put your bank in, that it wasn't equally safe at all banks because it wasn't just being stored in the vault. Uh, they understood the difference between at least people who were sophisticated enough to have bank accounts. Actually, less than half the population had bank accounts up until 1850, let's say. Most people were paid currency on payday. They would get an envelope full of banknotes. Now, they might not have understood what was entirely going on at the bank that was issuing the banknote, but they knew a good banknote from a bad banknote. And the way they knew was, would their own banker take it, if they had a banker, or would the merchant, would the shop on their street take it? Right? So people became as familiar as they needed to with the quality of the currency. They didn't have a deep understanding of how bank balance sheets work, I, I'm sure. But they understood that some banks were safer than others. Uh, and they understood that, I mean, that's why there were bank runs, because people understood that in circumstances where the bank lost money, there might not be enough to go around. So I think in that way, people did understand what was going on. People who had bank accounts, deposit accounts, had a contract with the bank, and they understood what the nature of that contract was. Uh, thank you. Good evening. My name is Pavel Risk. I'm from Charles University here in Prague. I have a very uh, practical question, which is, do you believe in the official CPI statistics of the U.S. government, or do you see any problems with the, the way it is computed? Thank you. I know that there's a, a website which purports to re give you the accurate CPI, 
as it would have been reported before they changed the composition of the basket a few years ago. Uh, it seems implausible to me that that would make a very big difference. I mean, the, the thing that's fishy is the way they adjust for quality. If you're just toting up the prices of bananas and bread and things that don't change their very much, yeah, I have no reason to think that it's being systematically falsified. It's difficult to, to adjust for quality. So if you have the price of tires, you have to adjust for the fact that tires last many more miles, kilometers now than they used to. But I think they, they try to do an honest job of that. Now, that's in the United States. In Argentina, <laughs> different story. In Argentina, the head of the statistical agency was fired because the inflation number was too high and replaced with somebody who was told to falsify it. And my friends in Argentina say, you have to go to a different website to find out what the actual CPI is. But I don't see any reason to think it's being grossly uh, distorted in the United States. I'm, I'm open to evidence to the contrary, but I haven't seen it. My name is Thomas Sunzi. I'm from University of Economics in Prague. Uh, Professor Weil, thank you very much for your great speech. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what do you think about the uh, theory of uh, exogenous money supply and endogenous money supply? And if uh, do you think that uh, Austrian business cycle theory could be interpreted somehow to these uh, two theories? Sorry, you said endogenous money supply? Uh, no, if um, Austrian business cycle theory mm -hmm. could be somehow interpreted through these theories of uh, money endogeneity and exogeneity, somehow. Somehow. Yeah, so in a free banking system uh, based on a gold standard, money is basically endogenous. That is, uh, under the price specie flow mechanism, money will flow in. It'll be determined endogenously by the demand of the people in the region to hold money. And the amount that a bank can issue, likewise, determined by the amount that people are willing to hold. So that's endogenous. Uh, in Austrian business cycle theory, I think it's not going to work unless you have an exogenous source of money to disturb the equilibrium between money supply and money demand. And that's the central bank. So central banks can come in and issue money and persist in issuing money for a long enough time and in great enough amount to generate a business cycle. In a system of decentralized issue, no issuer can do that. They might make small mistakes, but they'll be quickly corrected through the clearinghouse. A central bank can make a big mistake and can make it long enough to distort interest rates, which is a key part of the Austrian business cycle theory. So the story ha needs somebody who can change the money supply exogenously. Now, in the old version of the theory, where the assumption was it was under a gold standard, there was a kind of long-run endogeneity. So the story was the central bank overexpands, but eventually it starts to lose gold reserves, and then it stops expanding, and then you have the crisis. In a fiat money system, that's not when the crisis starts. The crisis, the, the central bank can go on expanding the quantity of fiat money. It can go on adding zeros forever. The crisis comes when people wake up to the fact that money is losing its value, and prices rise such that, in real terms, there's no longer uh, an injection to the supply of loanable funds. So the interest rate, although it was initially driven down, comes back to equilibrium. Uh, so even in a system where the quantity of money is exogenous, namely a fiat money system, I think the Austrian business cycle theory still applies. Uh, I have uh, one last question. Um, like, uh, since we are seeing so much uh, disruption of the monetary system lately, and, and the Fed had printed so much money, mm -hmm. and there were people who were telling there should be a, a doomsday by yesterday or by two years ago, uh, when do you think that, that this problem will manifest itself, and what do you think will, will start it, and why we are not seeing, from your perspective, any major uh, trouble yet with this. Okay. If you look at the uh, money supply statistics in the U.S., and I think the same thing is true in the Eurozone, 
It's the monetary base that's risen dramatically. That is, the liabilities of the central bank. But ordinary money held by the public hasn't risen dramatically. The M1 aggregate, the M2 aggregate, those have continued on an unremarkable path, really. The, what's happened is that at the same time that it uh, I'll talk about the Federal Reserve, that's the case I know better. At the same time that it bought a trillion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities, the Federal Reserve deliberately started paying banks to hold reserves, started paying interest on reserves. Previously, they had paid zero interest. European Central Bank has paid interest all along, so it's a little different, but the European Central Bank raised the interest rate they were paying on reserves. So in technical language, they sterilized the reserve injection so that it wouldn't expand money held by the public. And that's the anomalous situation we're in now. Banks are holding a trillion and a half dollars in excess reserves, reserves they're not legally compelled to hold, but that they hold because they're being paid interest to hold them. So how long can that go on? Well, as long as the Fed can afford to pay interest on the reserves. That's not forever. If interest rates start to rise to normal levels, the Fed will have to pay more and more interest on reserves. And there are very plausible scenarios under which the Fed has negative in net income. They're paying more interest than they're earning. Um, they can still print money to pay their employees. They're not going to shut down. Um, but it might be politically unpopular for them to do that. And so they're going to have to start backing out, right? But as long as, they're, as long as they're ready to pay interest, as much interest as it takes to get banks to bottle up the base money, M1 and M2 don't have to explode, and so the price level doesn't have to explode. Now, contingent on who gets uh, appointed to run the Federal Reserve, I'm betting that we will see a rise in inflation. Well, actually, not even contingent, <laughs> no matter who gets appointed. I think we're, it's likely we will go back up to 5% maybe 6% inflation before they decide to put the brakes on. But I don't see any reason to expect 10% or 20% inflation. Anything else? We still have time perhaps for one or two questions. Thank you. Uh, just general question, if I could. Uh, Actually, the lesson and uh, your speech was oriented probably to more liberal banking system for self-regulation. We have an anniversary of the Lehman Brothers in these days, and the all discussion uh, about that was about uh, more comprehensive regulations in banking system. But could you kindly Discuss it. So I couldn't hear everything you said, but I heard you ask, is my uh, lesson that we should move to a more liberal banking system? And basically, yes, but we have to be careful about the order of liberalization because deposit insurance has made banks systemly, uh, systemically weak. We've weakened our banks by giving them these guarantees that mean that they don't have to be well run in order to attract deposits. And so we need to start withdrawing those guarantees in a way that gives the banks an incentive to act, start behaving prudently. Because right now they're undercapitalized from uh, the perspective of a world without deposit insurance and they're taking too many risks. Back when banks issued banknotes without any reserve requirements without any deposit insurance. They held, as I said before, much more capital. They invested much more prudently. They didn't make 30-year subprime mortgages. They invested in commercial paper, basically, bills of exchange that had very short terms and were very safe. If you wanted a mortgage, you had to go to a savings bank. Savings bank had long-term savings deposits. It was safe for them to finance mortgages. It's not safe for a note-issuing bank to finance mortgages. So we need to make the banks safer, and then we can start to remove restrictions on banks issuing their own currency. Um, most of the restrictions on interest rates have already been lifted. 
um, once banks have adequate capital, we can lift portfolio restrictions. Um, we, we don't have to micromanage the banks anymore to try to keep them from taking uh, absurd risks. All right, one last question. Uh, you told that uh, we know uh, that all the gold is still there, and technically it's uh, certainly uh, true because it couldn't just disappear. But there are, uh, in the last time, there were a lot of fears about uh, this gold that people technically own. Uh, it's not actually in the banks that j they just uh, own partly empty certificates. Mm -hmm. And it was somehow uh, con uh, kind of confirmed when uh, Germans tried to withdraw some of their gold reserves from the United States. And there were at least rumors that Americans said that you cannot do it right now, you should do it later. So basically, do you believe that all gold is not just there, but we know where is it? And if it's not true, uh, is it dangerous for the system? You are right that the physical gold reserves in, of the U.S. Treasury in Fort Knox have not been audited in many, many years, something like 40 years. And a friend of mine who's familiar with auditing says that the first rule of auditing physical assets is if you don't touch them, uh, frequently, they tend to disappear. <laughs> so there is reason to be concerned, and I don't know why there hasn't been a physical audit. Uh, there should be. The gold that's held for foreign central banks, for the Bundesbank, for example, is in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and until recently, they gave tours of the gold vault. You could go down and see the bars. So I'm a little more confident that the gold is there. Now, it may have been hypothecated, and as it may have been lent out, uh, and so the Federal Reserve doesn't want to give it to Germany because technically it belongs to somebody else until the loan is over. Uh, I don't know. There is that danger. Uh, it's not reassuring, the fact that they couldn't just put the gold bars owned by Germany on a forklift and immediately take them to the harbor. Um, that is troubling. So um, maybe I was a little too quick to say all the gold is still there. They claim all the gold is still there. It's still being carried on the books. But it would be nice to have a physical audit. All right, that was the last sentence of this evening, at least of the formal part of this evening. Uh, Professor White, thank you for being with us. Uh, Thank you, audience, for not only listening to a great talk, but actually showing that you know a lot about the topic and your questions uh, were you know, very good. Uh, I only wish you keep coming back for other events at the Tevro Institute. Uh, I hope uh, Professor White also one day will be back here, perhaps next summer with another uh, summer school organized jointly by Tevro Institute and Foundation for Economic Education. In any case, it was terrific having you here, and I thank you for it. You. Have a nice evening. Thank you.